Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Beadle. For those of you that haven't been with us all day, uh, I'm the Senior Manager of Business Attraction and Strategic Planning at the RT Park. Welcome to our, our last panel of day one. This is our panel on telecom in the 21st century. So over the next 50 minutes or so, you'll hear from key players in the USVI's telecom industry discussing the modernization of the territory's infrastructure, including and especially uh, discussing leveraging our state-of-the-art fiber optic network and high-speed broadband access, which allows us to connect the local economy to the global marketplace. Uh, we will leave several minutes at the end for Q&A, so please submit any questions you have through Whova. Um, and with that, we'll just get started. So to my right, we have uh, Morris Reed, who's Chief Technology Officer at VIA, uh, Troy Weitenheimer, co-founder and president of Entest, which is a uh, RT Park client company, and with us remotely is Stephen Adams, president and CIO of uh, VINGN, which is the Virgin Islands Next Generation Network. So we're just gonna have a conversation, um, talk about the kind of telecom infrastructure and the VI, lessons learned from the last few years, plans for the future, stuff that um, it's very important to tech companies that maybe want to set up down here because obviously f fast, reliable internet is, is probably the most important thing to your average tech, uh, technology company. So uh, first question I have for you guys, um, you know, the 2017 hurricanes, they were very devastating to the USVI, had a severe impact on the infrastructure here. You know, I, I, <laughs> so, aftermath of the 2017 hurricanes, they were um, obviously devastating here, but it's also, I know, we've, there's been a lot of federal money, there's been a lot of rebuilding done. So, um, Morris, if you can start us off, if you can give us kind of an overview of what your organization has done to create a more resilient infrastructure in the territory so that hopefully the next time we get hit with a storm that bad, um, we're able to hopefully have less damage and recover faster. Thank you, Matt. So, um, after the hurricane, uh, the company, start investing in more, more fiber optic underground, collaboration with BINGN, um, dropping more fiber underground and activating those links, and, and just start looking at the entire network, looking at power systems, looking at monitoring systems, and, and just building more resilience into the network. Okay, that's great. And then, Stephen, can you talk a little bit about what BINGN has been doing for the last few years to kind of fortify and make the telecom more resilient? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, VINGN has, uh, uh, as Dara Wade was, uh, spoke earlier today, uh, is managing the middle mile for the territory. And we are, our, our, our aim is, of course, uh, provide uh, lower prices for the uh, ISP so that they can then provide services to the end users. We do not provide end user services only to the I, uh, ISP community. So we've been doing a, a lot this past uh, this past year in building resiliency and, and extra capacity in our network. And we're also embarked in a, in a, into a, a, a new venture where we're providing community Wi-Fi throughout the territory under an initiative um, from Governor Bryant and two different um, government grants, one being a CARES Act grant and the second one being an ARPA grant for Wi-Fi. And in the future with NTIA, we'll be um, expanding our middle mile for the, uh, for the ISPs, as well as getting into new infrastructure of 5Gs and, and with 5G and other, other technologies. Great, and then Troy, I know you have a little bit of different, you know, here in 2017, but the, by the nature of what you guys do, obviously you've dealt with storm damage and things like that. So I, can you t tell us about your kind of, how your company works, your product, and how you think it can you know, add resiliency to, in addition to the other work that's been done? Sure, uh, what our product does is it monitors the physical fiber. So when a hurricane comes through, or whatever it might be, earthquake, any kind of thing like that, um, and it damages the fiber, <clears throat> our product uh, identifies the problem and it locates it and it puts it on a map. And a good example for the Virgin Islands here 
is in New York. Uh, we had a, a customer, um, a carrier, and when Hurricane Sandy came through, they were using our product FiberWatch to monitor their entire network. And before the hurricane hit Long Island and New York, they could send the people responsible to do those repairs home with their trucks. And at home, as the hurricane went across, they could see on their phones what fibers were broken and damaged and where it was and which ones they were responsible to repair. So immediately after they had the green light to do the repairs, they could go right to location and fix those problems. So it results in a more resilient uh, network, getting the back up and running quickly when things like that happen. Yeah, no, that's great. And your technology also, I know, Underwater cables are a big concern here as right. well, and I think you said they can be—they're pretty accurate at determining those issues as well. Yep, exactly. So we have equipment here on St. Croix and on, on St. Thomas, and also the network is being monitored from Miami. Um, so we have in Miami all the islands going down to South America, Central America, Mexico, and it's all undersea cables, and we monitor that. So if there is like an earthquake. A fiber drop, you, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, an anchor drop that damages the fiber. We've even got um, uh, pictures of sharks. So sharks will grab a cable and, and, and mess with it and maybe For cause sure. a bend to it, yeah. yeah. We, they, they give out some, they have uh, equipment in there and it gives out a, 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 this, some sound waves that come off there and it can attract a, car, a, a shark. Okay. So we actually have a, a photo of that. I hope we should put it on our website. But anyway, <laughs> of a shark grabbing onto the cable. Yeah. And, you know, it kinks it, and then our equipment can show where that's at. They can go to that location and fix it. Yeah. A shark isn't going to break it, but they can damage it. Right. You know? yeah. No, that's, that's really handy. And how, how you said, I think you told me how accurate, relatively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so optically, it can, it can detect. Now, this is more like in a lab setting within yeah. uh, three meters. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it's when we're talking very ocean, close. Though, if you can get within three meters, you're going to be well within the ballpark. Yep, exactly. So, and then I also sorry, uh, want to introduce, thanks for that, Troy. That's, that's, yep. that's very cool. Um, Charles Jakeways from Liberty VI, Liberty Broadband VI uh, yeah. arrived just a couple minutes late. Um, so we'll move on to question two, and I'll loop you back in, Charles, OK? Um, question two, OK. So, so we talked about kind of rebuilding what we've learned from 2017. But I want to look, looking past that, what um, you know, new products, new services, kind of new things that you developed that you're excited that you want to that are potentially it would be available to our TPAR clients, you know, in the, in the near future, either now or in the next few years that you're kind of working to develop. Um, Charles, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. So uh, I'm basically working off talking points. So I'm going to jump into the spot where um, this works. Okay. Um, last year, our, our previous leadership uh, from the original Broadband VI founders team uh, took up uh, upon themselves to apply to the, uh, to be awarded a multi-million dollar grant from the SEC to be applied to a territory-wide fiber to the home project. Uh, to be more precise, the, this is uh, buried fiber optics applied uh, all the way from the home run, that would be at uh, Frederickstead, all the way to the homeowner, uh, capable of, of providing 75, 100, or 125 megabits symmetrical services packaged to each individual household and businesses in the territory with larger packages available uh, to commercial and enterprise uh, customers. And for those that, of you that don't already know, Broadband VI were recently required by Liberty that right now is rolling out our 5G mobile network. So that means wireless and wireline connectivity in the territory is about to get pretty dynamic. Uh, these new initiatives are going to mean that we, we're all going to be able to uh, choose from a wider array of services and providers, and those services invariably translate into lower cost to customers in the VI. So we're proud to be a part of that exercise, and we look forward to collaborating with our cohorts and comrades in, in the field. Yeah, that's great. I know the last mile connectivity has been a big 
question in, in the territory, so it's great that it's moving forward. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting. Yeah. Stephen, how about, how about VINGN? Is there, can you tell us a little bit about kind of new things that you're excited about, new, new plans you guys have? I know you could probably talk about new ideas for all, the whole hour, but what, what, do you, what are your most pressing ones? Oh, man, I'm that guy, huh? <laughs> so um, we're really excited um, about some of the, the upgrades that we're doing to our network. You know, since our network was built about 10, 11 years ago, we haven't had a lot of upgrades to our network. And one of the first things that we're doing is uh, increasing the, the capacity of our, our, our throughput from 10 gigs to 100 gigs. Uh, to our Miami and and um, uh, New York um, points uh, back to St. Croix. And that's really exciting to us because that's going to allow us to be able to do simultaneous <laughs> casting throughout the territory without um, you know, bottlenecks that sometimes occur. That's one of the, the upgrades that we have planned. Um, the, the one that's the most exciting for us um, is the, the free Wi-Fi throughout the territory. That's a Governor Bryan's initiative to be able to um, make broad uh, internet access available to all. And this also dovetails with the Biden administration's bipartisan uh, infrastructure initiative to be able to make uh, internet available for all. Now, I want to be able to put a caveat here because that does not mean that VINGN is getting into the last mile. That is the pure domain of the ISPs. Um, but we believe that uh, Wi-Fi is something that will benefit everybody in the territory so that there's everybody will at least have connectivity. Um, we leave it to the ISPs to be able to provide value-added services and high bandwidth to the home and to the businesses. But in the public domain, we plan to be able to, uh, we're already doing this project. There's a lot of parks and uh, areas throughout the territory that are now um, lit. Uh, one of the most exciting ones that we did was provide free um, uh, Wi-Fi to every public housing courtyard. And we believe that that's meaningful in closing the digital divide. So you're gonna see more of those types of activities from us um, with the infrastructure monies that are available to VINGN. We plan to be able to help the ISPs with their capital projects uh, if they're willing and um, trying to offset their costs so that they can provide um, better um, or, or cheaper uh, services uh, to their end users. You know, in the Virgin Islands, we are not at lack of having fiber. You know, we have three backbone rings in the territory, which is significant. What we lack in the territory is affordability. So what VI Engine can do to help with affordability is to be able to help expand these networks, help defray some of the costs of the ISPs so they can do their, their job more effectively and still make a profit. So th those are some of the things high level of what we're, what we're up to. Oh, yeah, that's, that sounds that's great. Sounds I think great. anything that, you know, digital vibe digital is, vibe. is a very big issue. It's something we, you know, when we want to do VI STEM kids, when we want to work with entrepreneurs, sometimes they're, they don't have reliable internet access out of their home, so they have to, you know, they have to come to the coworking space. We have to bring them to other locations, and anything we can do to kind of extend that is great. So that's great to hear. Yeah, uh, Morris, do you want to talk a little sure. bit about Vias plans? As you know, Via is a, is a full full service telecom provider, wireless, uh, fix. Um, we have we have done a year and a half ago major upgrade. Uh, we can deliver one gig service to any home in the VI, and um, one gig symmetrical to any business. Um, as far as the wireless network, the same wireless network, we stand up very quickly after the hurricane, uh, deployed over 10,000 uh, mobile gateways, uh, stand up uh, 25 plus um, Wi-Fi centers, call centers. Mm -hmm. um, so Lia is not just a telecom provider. We are a solutions provider. We do HPVX, IP office, managed services, you know, team solutions. So we're a full service provider. We use our wired network and our wireless network to back up each other, right? Yeah. Um, we have a service now that we provide to the businesses. You buy the fixed fix services and we, we, we implement the wireless backup, which is a seamless um, 
cross over if you lose service on one side. I think that's very important for businesses, mm -hmm. you know, going forward. Um, what else can I say about the network? We're a full service telecom provider. Whatever service you need, we have, you know, we're part of at &I, which is um, a, a national company. So we, we leverage our sister companies to, to deliver solutions, um, software development, and, and many other services. So we're, 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 we're not just a telecom company, as a lot of people think. We're, we're a service, we're a solution, service provider. Yeah, no, that's great. That's, um, like I said, you know, Tech companies need a lot of need a lot of redundancy when they're getting set up. So that's that's good to know. And then Troy, I'll let you go first next time. I want you to go last one. Okay. Question, but <laughs> what uh, what about Antest? I know you guys I are still. About things, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know you guys are you're relatively new to the to the territory. So kind of what you guys are yeah. as you scale up, what you're really looking and excited about the next couple year or two. Yeah. So going ahead, as everyone has said, you know the fiber is getting closer and closer to the home or to the home and to the business. And our role is to make it easier for these people to have their networks being reliable, dependable, and when things happen, and they do happen, they always happen everywhere, there's always fiber breaks, um, so they can, they can identify that and fix it quickly. So in the case of fiber to the home, it's a relatively new product. Um, but we have it existing. We have some very good case studies on, on, um, on uh, our, cu our customers that are using it. So we monitor all the way to the home. So um, a lot of times uh, the carriers, if, if uh, a, a, a home drops off the network, they get an alarm. But they might send someone with a splice truck to splice a fiber, mm -hmm. but maybe somebody unplugged, you know, maybe they have a child or the dog chewed on the power cord or something, you know, it came yeah. apart. Well, it's not a fiber problem. So you just wasted a roll and that network is still down for that person. So our product can, if, they, if it, it sends a, a, a light, a laser light to that home, and if it hits the end point, you know it's not a fiber problem, it's probably an equipment problem. It might not be unplugged, it may be unplugged, but it might be the box. So you can send the person responsible to replace that box. So you just become much more efficient, your network is much more reliable. And we just continue to work with these guys and um, uh, improving the product and getting closer and closer to the home. Yeah, no, that's great. <clears throat> I mean, I know. When you're at home and the internet's out, whatever whatever it does to get it back up faster is what you want. And it's so important now with remote yeah. working, but then also remote learning. You, mm -hmm. you know, depending on what COVID's going to do in the long run, you, you have so many people that are dependent on a solid, reliable network yeah. at their home yeah. or their business. That's a really good. I didn't think about remote learning, but that's definitely not going away. Whether it's college, whether it's you know K through 12, it's definitely huge, especially for. Um, you know, summer school and things like that when kids really need to get caught up. So that's great. Exactly. Yep. So, okay. So, and then, so we've kind of talked about the last few years, talked about the immediate future. Um, to kind of wrap up before we take questions from the audience, I really want to, <coughs> let's look out, let's say 2030. Imagine you have all the resources, you need a magic wand to say, you know, what do you and your company really want to see happen in the USVI, you know, in the next eight to 10 years? So, Troy, why don't we let you go first this time? So I need to go last. Let me first this time. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, for me, it's just to continue to provide a product that helps these people, uh, the carriers, have a reliable network. That's our role, that's what we do. So depending on how they go about things, um, in this setting, and uh, I'm going to take a broader kind of look at it, is um, what I would like to see in 2030 is a student from here that's now a member of the RT Park, and they were able to get the needed tools to become successful. And uh, you know we're uh, going to set up a lab here so they can have some hands-on experience with fiber optics. And whether that's the direction they go or not, it's it's good knowledge to be able to explain uh, you know how it works and that they've seen it and just an understanding of that. So in 2030, I'm hoping a student will be sitting here. And, uh, and you'll be talking to them about how they got here. Yeah, I mean, I hope that's true too. I hope we have a whole table full of UBI yeah. entrepreneurs. That'd be great. Um, Morris, what about you guys at VIA? Sure, as we look forward you know, in 2030, right? Um, right now we look at our three to five years plan mm -hmm. because the next 10 years, the technology will change a lot. Yeah. So, so we're putting in systems that is adaptable, 
that's future proof. So whatever is coming in the next few years, we can integrate it. So for example, we already have our plan to roll out 5G. We have many plans to roll out, many other things that I can't discuss. Mm -hmm. um, we have two core cities on the island to ensure we're resilient. One in St. Croix, one in St. Thomas. We built a ring up to the states. So to ensure just we have very good service, uh, people have access to the service, and it's reliable. And whatever other technology comes, it can be integrated. So we, we stay on the cutting edge. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, asking a tech company what they're going to do in 10 years is always, it's a <laughs> yeah. bit fraught. It's a bit like science fiction, but it's, I mean, I think that adaptability is probably the most important thing to yeah. have, so that's really good to hear. Um, Charles, do you want to kind of answer the same question about liberty and broadband? Yeah. Uh, Troy. Quit reading off my script, man. Really? You're going to put in test? You're going to put fiber watch in, huh? It's the same thing. I mean, not quite. Okay. You know, but close. Uh, I've been researching the tech behind uh, your fiber and what you do and how you do it. But the, are you using the uh, piezoelectric wrapping, or are you just doing pure light? Laser light right now, I think. Okay. But if the you Europeans, have a need for that, the Europeans we'll have uh, piezoelectric wrapping that you okay. put around the thing. And so if there's any tectonic movement or if there's any slight adjustment that doesn't affect the glass, right. that gets registered also and you get to see where it is. Okay. So it's a cool thing, mm -hmm. super expensive, may not happen. But and that's on the fiber. Yeah, the Europeans are doing yeah. it. Yeah, so our they, system would they, monitor that fiber and it would detect that. Exactly. Uh, yep. And okay. they've got the tools that you hook up to the end of it and you get the same data, except you get more accurate data on the location. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, to your question, I would like to enable and empower prospective data-centric and IT-based enterprises who see St. Croix and the VI for what it should be. The nexus between North and South America with the two fattest and fastest subsea fibers on the planet are literally here. So how do we leverage that? It, we've tried, we're doing it, we've coupled it with economic environmental, um, uh, an economic environment that enjoys tax abatements for qualifying applicants as part of the U.S. protectorates, and that should make us an obvious choice for anyone in the business who has those decisions to make. With them will come economic opportunities for Virgin Islanders in those industries, which are, generally speaking, uh, portable vocations, uh, which would give them broader horizons and opportunity for world travel and expanding their horizons and bringing them back home to us, which would make us richer for it. Uh, to make that scenario truly exceed expectations, however, we would also have to solve a few other minor details, like providing a higher caliber of vocational and professional education in the training in the arts and sciences, getting our energy costs more in line with stateside rates and reliability, and improving our healthcare system and infrastructure. But hey, you said all resources. That yeah, you need. magic wand. <laughs> so um, that's my wish for okay. us. Great, uh, so Stephen. Before we go to questions from the audience, do you want to kind of take us home with your your vision for ten years from now? Sure. to be the internet of things. And I think one of the things that we learned through COVID is that everything is now on the internet. So we need to be able to be prepared to be able to deal with the increased bandwidth, the resiliency of that bandwidth and, and, um, um, and, and the performance of that bandwidth. So that's the first trend that we see. The second trend that we see that we're preparing ourselves for is uh, increased mobility of internet access. When VINGN was established, um, you know, dial-up was uh, the norm and uh, occasional e uh, email 
was done. Now we have voice over IP. We now have uh, VR, AR. We also have drones. We have all kinds of automated processes that are now run through the internet. And that's just in the last 10 years. So by 30, 2030, uh, we can, uh, that those trends are going to accelerate and new ones will emerge. The third one, which is one that's a little bit more wonky, but it's important to the internet of everything, which is the increase uh, of cloud services, right? This is a lot of the cloud services are usually talked about in the in the business realm of enterprise software but anytime you buy something from amazon you get something uh you you if you're in the mainland using uber or any online app those are uh, all those applications are being run through servers so vingn will get into the uh, data center business uh, to be able to support our network and our partners with uh, providing uh, cloud services. And then the last trend that we, we see is probably the most exciting of the trends, and that's the increase in content generation uh, at, uh, by home users. We see this already now with TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, but that's going to accelerate, especially once mixed reality, uh, AR and a AR and VR really take hold in the public in the public sphere. And when that happens, that's going to increase bandwidth exponentially. Uh, and the throughput is going to um, be incredibly important as well as the reliability. Um, that's here now, but by 2030, it will be commonplace as is the mobile phone today. So those are the four trends that we see and that we're preparing our network to be able to um, cope with those types of, um, or take advantage of those opportunities and enable those opportunities. So the Virgin Islands is keeping pace with the mainland and with the world rather than just being a, and rather than being a laggard in, in, in this regard. That's, that's great to hear. That's um, keep like you, I think the, your last point, keeping up or you know leading the way is, is really what we want to see as much as possible down here. Um, so we have some questions from the audience. This first one is probably the one we get asked the most, and I, I, I'm sure most of you could probably answer this. But um, how do internet speeds in the USVI compare to in the mainland US? So I don't know if anyone wants to take that. Uh, as far from from my perspective, via. Um, we're right up there with the tier ones in the in the in the in the mainland. Um, we look at those technologies. Those are the technology we bring here. All our people are certified um, international standards. We're delivering one gig. A lot of areas in the states are still not delivering one gig down. Yeah. And every home here can have one gig. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Anything else? Like, that was a pretty comprehensive answer, I think. Um, this is a bit of a broader question, but I think it's a good one. Um, so what can the local government and the RT, RT Park do to help um, kind of reduce the digital divide that I know a couple of you guys have talked about where we're having trouble not getting our, off our whole kind of community connected? So I don't know, anybody has a good answer? I'll put one out there. There's a number of programs on today via uh, via collaborate with, with, with many entities, um, various programs that's out there to assist. You know, the, the government gives out vouchers and so on, but a lot of people don't know about it. Um, I know VIA go on a campaign to assist and have people sign up. So while you can't get it to everyone, there's, there's subsidies out there that people are not aware of, okay. which we accept at VIA. Yeah, so maybe just helping educate the community Educ about Educate okay. the community that this, this is available and, and you know, it's, it's good money. Yeah, that's good. And Charles, you good? The, uh, there's a community Wi-Fi Connect program uh, that we're collaborating with, uh, with NGN and the Department of Education. Uh, they are providing um, free, um, unsubscribed access uh, to something north of 60 sites throughout the territory uh, for communities, uh, community centers, education centers, um, housing operations, and um, we are a part and parcel of that project. We're uh, providing um, wireless backup NGN is providing the wired, back, uh, the wired uh, primary, mm -hmm. 
And so we're collaborating with them to maintain uh, connectivity for those sites. And it's uh, very exciting and we're um, super busy right now. <laughs> doing it's a that. good problem to have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve Which is why, oh, go ahead, Charles. partially why I'm late. Okay. <laughs> happens. Uh, Steven or Troy, did you guys have anything that you wanted to share? On this one? Yeah, I would. There's, there's a program, so we'll be able to talk more about this in the coming months because we, uh, VINGEN will be administering the uh, Biden administration's uh, or the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And there's two components in there that's very important for this conversation. One of them is the Dig Digital Equity Act, and the other one is the uh, Access Communication uh, communi uh, Connectivity Act. I understand that. Via has actually been pretty aggressive on the on the latter of these programs. The the uh, ACP that it's called is basically a thirty dollars subsidy for low income individuals to be able to buy a high bandwidth um, at uh, for thirty dollars. The the aim is to be able to have a package that's free for them. And then there's the Digital Equity Act, uh, uh, Digital Equity Act, which is really a program for the nonprofit sectors and for private entities to be able to develop programs that were gonna help close the digital divide, whether it's through community uh, access centers or special outreach programs. Because from the previous question about um, pricing, I mean, about connectivity speed, connectivity speed is really a, a market-driven uh, um, uh, question. The real question here is affordability. And I'm keenly focused on affordability because once you start making the internet uh, affordable, just by making it affordable or free in a lot of instances, you close the digital divide because now you're allowing, you're enabling more people to be able to have access. At the end of the day, it's an access game. And access is all about affordability. It's not about speeds, it's not about widgets, it's not about bits and bytes, it's about affordability. So the internet is, it's not really a luxury anymore, it's a requirement. So whatever we can do to make that, yeah. Right. So, Troy, were you gonna, yeah, it's okay. You know, I, I'm not a, on the carrier side, yeah, yeah, that's what, but I, I agree with all that. When the US, uh, you know, mainland, when they built up, uh, when they electrified and put electricity throughout cities or they put uh, city water in, they didn't put it to only certain homes. Mm -hmm. They put it to all the homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's what needs to be done here. It's it's very critical. And you know, if you don't have access to to uh, a, a reliable network, especially if you're a student and, and the school is shut down, you you know you're you're falling behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's, an, that's a really good analogy, I think, to other kind of things that we just take for granted that haven't right. always been as widely available. So. Yeah. Um, this is a good one that I think you guys will all enjoy answering. Uh, so what types of career and educational choices are good for if you want to work in telecom? So if I'm just graduated high school and I'm going, you know, what should I be studying? What kind of, kind of, kind of opportunity should I be seeking out if I want to work in telecom in the future? Not me, I'm saying a hypothetical <laughs> student. Let's see. I'm happy with the RT part. I got one. Yeah. IPv6. We're running out of IPv4 uh, addresses we're not going to be able to do the IOT or the IOE without IPv6. Okay. IPv6. Do you mind for, so everybody know what IPv6 is? Uh, there are two different protocols. Uh, IPv4 is the one that we are starting to learn a little about. You know, it's that really long phone number that uh, some of them work some of them need to get translated into a public IP. Um, we're just, the general public is just now starting to get a handle on what that is and kind of sort of how it works and they're fiddling with their routers and they're, you know, figuring it out. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're starting to add uh, tens of billions, uh, hundreds of billions of new instruments in the internet of everything. Yeah. Cars are gonna have like 300 data points and they're all gonna wanna have uh, individual IP addresses, addressable 
addresses. That's routable addresses. So that's the new hurdle that's going to be coming up on us uh, in the not too distant future. We have challenges ahead of us. And um, if you thought IPv4 was hard, it's got like real numbers with real octets that you can kind of figure out. IPv6 is the same thing with more, and it's all in hexadecimal. So it's going to be hard. Yeah. Uh, there are protocols that still haven't been able to adapt to it, like MPLS and uh, BGP, uh, which is in our realm. But uh, all of that is in our future. And we have to figure it out. I'm getting old. You young guys need to study this and get down with it so you can take over the mantle. Okay. That's my so, reason. I'm sticking with it. One of my challenges is really finding quality entry level, uh, you know, I would say young people that's ready to learn, be inserted in a program, have, have what it takes to start the job. Um, not just the one sitting behind a computer, mm -hmm. but actually doing the installation, the trade level. It, because the people who do installation is no longer just pulling cables. You have to understand, you know, probably not IP to some, some degree, but you have to understand a little more. So having people with the requisite skills to come in and start learning technology, because the technology is so, so broad. And so many things happening at the same time. You know, you're, you're dealing with a gateway. You know, you have to be dealing with IoT services and so on. So having people having the basic skills and knowledge and ready to absorb. Because, for example, via we have many traded in programs for each um, tech level that comes in. But just finding people with the requisite skill to, to insert in the job and ready to go. Okay. So you have a lot of on-the-job training, really. Just more it, of it's kind of a general technical aptitude and a willingness to learn? Is e kind of exactly. Okay. We have programs for each level of, you know, whether technician, engineer, so on and so forth. Yeah. We invest in our employees a lot in terms of training. But finding the, 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 you know, like I have positions out there, it's just hard to find people who has just that base knowledge to come in and be ready to, to learn. Okay. That's where I think my challenge is gotcha. as far as that's concerned. Okay. Troy or Steven, is there any, any other it, career? Advice? Yeah, I, I always look at it. I struggled with school. You know, I'm kind of hyper. I, I, have a, I have a hard time sitting here right now yeah. this time. We're but, almost done. Don't worry. Okay. We're almost done. You're doing great. And, and, uh, and yet, um, I'm sitting here, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I wasn't good at math. And, and, and I think some people uh, might be thinking, well, I. I can't go into that. It's fiber optics, it's telecommunications, it's physics, it's whatever. It's a broad industry. If you have an interest in there, you can dabble in it, and maybe not to the point of IP V6, V6 <laughs> you know, but sales, marketing, mm -hmm. um, advertising, mm -hmm. and I'm not pushing away from that because I did end up getting an engineering degree even though I struggled. I, you know, it, I, I still believe in kind of a broad education. And you're naturally going to, all of a sudden, if you can, if you're drawn in that direction, you've got a skill there that you weren't aware of. Right. You know, but if you just like, I have no clue about this, but he's out, you know, having fun with his friends and talking and chatting about telecom, he's, he could be a sales guy, you know. So there's a lot of, there's a, a, a lot of positions out there, uh, technical and non-technical. Yeah. I agree. Uh, that's a good point. It's not all, it's not all engineering. It's not all, and it. You know, my, I, I'm the nerd in my family. My brothers are all, they're all in the trades. And they're, I can't fix anything. And they, <laughs> but like, they master that stuff. I would, you know, my brother's an electrician. I don't know how he does it. He didn't do great in school, but he, he could rattle off the, and he can wire this whole building if you needed to. So it's, there's definitely different skill sets that I think you can mm -hmm. utilize. Yeah, follow your muse. Yeah, yeah. exactly, right. follow your muse, that's a good one. <laughs> Steven, was there anything you wanted to add to this one? Um, more echo, but there's four different categories that um, on the technical side that kind of something for everybody. Um, you know, one is something I mentioned before, which is content development that that goes to our, our keynote speaker this morning about, um, you know, everyone's now a, a director, a, a, a videographer, what have you. So the um, the content development is part of of telecom now. It didn't used to be, but now it is. 
Um, software development, of course, uh, app development, you know, uh, on mobile devices is the second and the third one of, of the easiest would be uh, network management uh, for those who are inclined like that. And then the last one, which is kind of an obscure one, but those who are more um, uh, uh, adept with, um, with data, which is data visualization, right? You know, we have a crunch of data that's out there now. And all these devices what, of the Internet of Things is throwing off a lot of data and the data needs to be analyzed. So those who are analytical like that, they're, the world is their oyster. Um, and, and, it, and all four of these areas will pay extremely well. Yeah, I can echo that. I was at policy school and data analysis. That. And the kids who really went into that, they had like IBM jobs waiting for them. <laughs> the rest of us are, you know, public sector, we're doing all right, but they're, they're doing very well if, the, if you can really get into R and Stata and things like that and really be able to do something with all the data that's floating around out there. That's huge. So um, we just have a couple minutes left, so I don't want to dive into any of these other questions because they're kind of involved. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all of, so much to all the panelists. Um, this was really educational. I really liked it. I think hopefully our, our people at home learned a lot about, you know, um, one, internet here is just as fast. Two, we have a lot of very exciting things coming down the pipe and a lot of very smart people and very kind of enthusiastic people about telecom down here. You know, it's, it's just one kind of section of when we talk about the tech ecosystem, but it's probably the most important because you can't really do the rest of a tech hub if you don't have solid infrastructure to start with. So we really appreciate it. So, um, so this was our final panel of day one. Thank you for sticking with us. We'll be back here tomorrow with several um, back at 9 a.m. To wrap up, Peter Chapman, the CEO of the RT Park, will give a, a few closing remarks. So thanks to everyone in the audience for spending the day with us, and thanks again to my panelists for taking, taking the time to talk to us about everything we're doing here in the VI. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome.